We've got a great team of presenters from around the world, not from quite so far away, from Cape Town, from the USA, from Germany, and England. So really looking forward to this. We'll hear those four presentations, and then we'll have a panel discussion afterwards when we'll be joined by Per Van Blick because he's very much orchestrated this session and this work. So please write down your questions, hold them till the end. So now I'm going to turn to my co-chair, Professor Prasad, who's going to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, uh, Julian. I'm Kameshwar Prasad, Professor and Chair of Neurology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, India. And I'm representing here the International Society for Evidence-Based Healthcare. I'm sure it's going to be a great uh, session, and I have a great pleasure in introducing the first speaker, uh, Chris Mavergems, Head of Informatics and Knowledge Management and Chief Information Officer for Cochrane. Chris leads Cochrane's technology and knowledge management infrastructure, including software and tools, tools for evidence synthesis in healthcare, websites, and other tools and data services, including the Cochrane-linked data project. Chris has research interest in machine learning and text mining, cementing technologies, and a passion for metadata. It's a great pleasure in uh, inviting Chris to talk on evidence ecosystem concept and advances in evidence synthesis and dissemination. Chris, please. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here speaking at the first, evidence, at the first ever evidence, Global Evidence Summit. I want to thank the organizers and the scientific committee for inviting me to talk on this evidence ecosystem concept. And many thanks to Lynn Brandt, Per Vanvik, Alonzo Labra, and Jan Clarkson, and many others for their input into this talk. I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. So as Jill said, um, this plenary will show how explicit links between actors are needed and are now possible to close the loop between new evidence and improved care through a culture of sharing evidence combined with advances in methods and technology platforms for digitally structured data in a trustworthy evidence ecosystem. And I think we all know what we mean when we hear the term ecosystem, right? And since we're on this magnificent continent, we could uh, refer to the African savanna as an example to draw the metaphor. And obviously, without going into detail, a healthy ecosystem is made up of multiple interacting, in this case, food chains, food webs, creatures, etc. And that's, that's what we're referring to, is an ecosystem that's, that's well-balanced and interacting. And uh, later, over a drink, we can debate whether or not systematic reviewers or guideline developers would be considered scavengers or de decomposers or producers. I love when the joke works. Um, right, so <laughs> the digital and trustworthy evidence ecosystem to increase value and reduce waste in research. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go into some level of detail here to introduce these concepts because they build on for the other speakers and the threaded sessions today. So it's not that we don't already have an ecosystem, it's just that it's currently poorly functioning and there are challenges at every step. So starting at your nine o'clock with evidence producers, we have the issue that research evidence is often unreliable, off-target. Big data and other data sources are exciting, but do they add value? How do you have the methods to incorporate them? Moving on to evidence synthesizers, you have the issue that systematic reviews are often irrelevant, incomplete, and take too long to produce an update with lots of duplication of effort. Moving into clinicians, dissemination to clinicians, you have that guidelines are often outdated, costly, and inefficiently disseminated in suboptimal formats. Moving on to patients, you have the issue that the dissemination is limited in the first place, and it's hard to support shared decision making. In terms of implementation, um, they may not target the most important gaps and fail to identify and use best current evidence. And there's a lack of tools, so clinical decision support syst uh, systems in electronic health records. And finally, in terms of evaluation and quality improvement, you have that data from registries is often of poor quality, unstructured, and largely remains unpublished. So the bottom line is, 
evidence implementation, evaluation, and quality improvement lacks coordination, or at best, it's a hit or miss process. Overall, there's no support or easy access to people, methods, and tools in the current ecosystem. So this is our vision for the, the how, the answer to these issues. So starting again at 9 o'clock, we have um, producing evidence. So we need more relevant and higher quality primary research, real world evidence, and big data. We need that data to flow as seamlessly as possible into synthesizing evidence, where we have relevant, structured, and living systematic reviews that are then fed to disseminate evidence to clinicians through trustworthy, well-disseminated, and living practice guidelines, living clinical practice guidelines, on to patients where we have trustworthy evidence that supports shared and personalized decisions and living decision aids linked to living guidelines. And in terms of implementation, we need trustworthy evidence and guidelines for the cl clinical decision support and electronic health records, quality improvement initiatives that are linked to the evaluation of care and the production of new evidence. And finally, we need recording of real-world evidence and structured electronic health records and registries that are linked to evidence production to sort of close that loop. And in the center, you have the sort of main cogs and uh, pillars of this system, which is at, 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 the, at the core is trustworthy evidence, common understanding of methods, a culture of sharing, and then finally the technology bit, which is at my heart, um, tools and platforms and digitally structured data. And I would add not just digitally structured, but well described, so metadata. And if we move on to the actors in this ecosystem and how the data flows, again starting at the same position, the producers need to plan, conduct, and publish primary research. The more relevant and high quality primary research in big data needs to flow into synthesis where it's analyzed and published in systematic reviews. Moving on to clinicians, you have tools to analyze and write publish and publish trustworthy guidelines. Moving to patients, you need decision aids for the clinical encounter and that data flows as seamlessly as possible into decision support systems that are linked to patient specific data and finally into the EHR registries, quality indicators, and supporting shared decision making. So overall, bringing all this together, what we want is to support and have easy access to people, methods, and tools using digitally structured data in this ecosystem. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about um, the emerging, in this case, uh, lowercase e, ecosystem within Cochrane or within that evidence synthesis bit there in the uh, in the larger ecosystem and how Cochrane is contributing. So as you probably all know, many of the same challenges plague systematic review and evidence synthesis. Our processes are manual, there's loads of duplication of effort and it takes a long time. Human and machine effort is not efficient and optimized. Our tools are really not yet fit for purpose and, and not as connected as we'd like them to be. There's a lack of data provenance that impedes reuse and traceability. And I think all of this and other issues contribute to the outputs not being optimized for use and impact. So bottom line, a few years ago, Cochrane recognized that we needed new approaches to gathering, synthesizing, and disseminating evidence. And Cochrane has invested heavily in the last few years in innovative projects to address these issues. This is our lovely ecosystem diagram within Cochrane, done by the Cochrane comms team. And what we're effectively trying to do is align communities of people their processes with applications and data stores in order to uh, create a standardized workflow that leverages technology and automation to reduce manual work, creates more structured, well-described data with tools that are fit for purpose and connected along with new models of participation that engage more people in evidence production and make it more efficient. And we're doing this uh, briefly by projects like Project Transform, which has a component called Evidence Pipeline which uses machine learning and text mining to make finding and classifying um, research more efficient. Cochrane Crowd, which is Cochrane's citizen science crowdsourcing platform, which engages the public in micro tasks that contribute to classifying evidence. Task Exchange, which is a peer to peer network platform that connects people who need help with their review with people who have the skills and time to do so and more recently and excitingly with their guidelines. So recognizing our partnership with Jin um, here with their logo on the homepage. And finally, the Living Systematic Review Net Network uh, work, which, um, and I'd just like to highlight the publication of the first two Living Cochrane Systematic Reviews that were just published last week in the Cochrane Library. 
So this is all becoming very real now, and I want to congratulate the authors on those, those two reviews. The Linked Data Project in Cochrane has created a suite of linked data tools for describing Cochrane evidence with a PICO ontology to allow us to create a PICO database that links evidence across, across Cochrane and beyond to improve discover, discoverability and dissemination. And finally, in our review production toolkit, we're upgrading and adding to it. RevMan Web will roll out in the next few months. The Cochrane Register of Studies Web is um, almost fully rolled out. Covenants, Epi Reviewer, and also working with tools like GradePro, GDT, and Magic and to be more connected and have a toolkit that improves production and leverages our rich data stores um, in making evidence since this more efficient. So I'm going to take a second to take a breath. You can look at this lovely picture of Table Mountain. It's important for me to do this. All right, in the remaining time that I have, I wanted to show some examples of the ecosystem in action at different um, points in the, uh, in the circle there. So first, when we're talking about platforms and tools, um, we say that we need them to be more connected and data to flow. This is an example of connecting tools in the ecosystem via digitally structured data from synthesis to recommendation into guideline development. This is an example of connecting a tool we have called uh, Pico Finder, which leverages the Pico link data I just described and services it using Pico questions that can be used by other applications, so such as the Magic App, which is a guideline authoring tool. So the Magic App, or Making Grade the Irresistible Choice, that's the acronym, is a guideline authoring platform that lets users create structured recommendations for publication in digitally structured guidelines and other publications. And in Magic, the PICO is described using structured data and controlled terminology sets, such as SNOMED CT, which Cochrane are using in our linked data work. So here is a recommendation for a dementia guideline being offered in the app. An API, or application programming interface, can query the PICO finder directly. They talk to each other and see if Cochrane has a review on this particular intervention, which is Mementine for dementia. The view over in Pico Finder shows the, re the result, that yes, indeed, we do. And here is the specific outcome or subgroup of interest for this recommendation. The data can be pulled over automatically and to inform the creation of evidence profile in the recommendation. So this is an example of dissemination using the ecosystem. And it's uh, from a dentistry guideline. Um, from Alonzo Carrasco Labra and the Cochrane Oral Health Group on alpha testing the ecosystem in dentistry. So there's this American Dental Association guideline on early detection of oral cancer from 2010, included synthesis done by the authors of the guideline. And then there are two Cochrane reviews published in 2015 and 13, respectively, one a DTA review that were available to update the guideline. But the reviews also needed updating at the time. So I'll just walk through um, how this was done, but the Cochrane Oral Health Group were very closely involved, including one of the lead authors, Tanya Walsh, um, in this process. So you have here the top part of the ecosystem. There's the guideline, early detection of oral cancer guideline panel. There's the lovely guideline panel. And they formulate their PICO question and query Cochrane. The two Cochrane reviews are brought into the process along with the methodological and statistical expertise from the Cochrane Oral Health Group. Data is shared, and the update is uh, to the reviews in the, um, are, is generated, and grade and evidence profiles generated, and into the recommendation, and guidelines, sorry, in three months. Three months. <laughs> um, quite quick, and including the guideline being disseminated to patients in the form of infographics and decision aids. So as you can see here, when people in process are working together, sharing expertise and sharing data, you can reduce three, what usually takes years down to three months. So the positives and negatives of their experience from this uh, alpha test, 
the positives there. Uh, reduction in time from two years to three months is an obvious positive. Also reduction in resources, fewer people involved. Um, additional guidance on the analysis was provided and it provided a framework for summarizing the evidence. Some of the negatives were the need to update the searches, the context dependence of the review and the guideline, so matching up to PICO questions. The panel needed specific comparisons, so there was reorganization of the data needed, and many methodological decisions were needed to be reviewed by the ADA team. So their experience, uh, in their experience, the challenges of operating in the ecosystem were that um, and along the top part of the ecosystem from primary evidence to dissemination were that there was poor quality of clinical practice guidelines and systematic reviews, lack of channels to share data, and in this case platforms, lack of communication across institutions, standardized methodologies weren't, weren't standardized, uh, again, lack of platforms, and there was a poor understanding actually of shared decision making in this case. Along the bottom of the ecosystem, so from implementation closing the loop, we, there was a lack of implementation of decision support systems in the, in this case, EDR, uh, difficulty in measuring compliance with the recommendations and outcomes, uh, again, lack of platforms to share um, digitally structured data, and a lack of connection between real data in clinical practice and basic research. So speaking of closing the loop, um, this last example I'm going to walk through is on the Rapid Rex uh, project. So rapid recs or rec rapid recommendations are a collaborative network to rapidly update systematic reviews and create digitally structured trustworthy recommendations using the Magic App as a response to potentially practice changing evidence. And you saw a good, ex a really inspiring and wonderful example of this yesterday in Patrick Oquin's talk on the BMJ rapid recs uh, project on HIV. So again, we have the ecosystem. I'll just very quickly walk through this example. So starting at, again, 9 o'clock, um, you had a new trial published um, alongside already existing 23 trials of around 4,000 participants that um, in was included in an update of a Cochrane review which shifted the, um, the evidence uh, in favor of offering probiotics in addition to antibiotics for infants with infection. And the benefits clearly outweighed the harms when the evidence profile was done. So the, the point here is how quickly can we get this and close the loop in a pilot in Finland and Belgium into the electronic health record. So it's about pushing it through there. And the baseline was three out of 100 um, currently. So into practice, 17-month-old Stella with pneumonias prescribed antibiotics in Belgium primary care. In the electronic health record, the recommendation is pushed through automatically which recommends an addition of probiotics to the prescription um, directly in the electronic health record. And you can drill back to the evidence in, if needed in the MAGIC app, to the recommendation, evidence summary, or even all the way to the meta-analysis or the characteristics of the trials that were included um, in uh, supporting this, this evidence base. And what this allows is you know, acting on and implementing the evidence together, so shared, shared decision making at the point of care. And the same goes for Finland, similar trigger in an elect finished medical record to add probiotics to this particular um, treatment. So I'm ahead of time, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, so in summary, uh, the digital and trustworthy evidence ecosystem is, is emerging. In some, in some areas, it's, it's already very much active. There are new and improved methods and tools available. Digitally structured linked data with sharing across platforms and organizations is now possible. Um, but as I always like to say, the, the tech part usually comes together fairly well once the people in process figure out what they want the tech to do. So I think we need people in process to evolve to leverage this new ecosystem, including promoting a culture of sharing, adapting to standards and structuring of data, a con common understanding of research me methods, and somewhat tricky incorporation of evidence from diverse sources. So what do we do about big data and other observational data, and how do we get the methods uh, rigorous enough to incorporate those into this process? So I just want to plug the uh, threaded special sessions that are uh, occurring that will build on the concepts from uh, this uh, morning's plenary. Um, they're in the uh, program and on your app, and I'll, the slide will come up again at the end to remind you, and I encourage you all to attend them if you want to get more information about how this ecosystem is, uh, 
is being used. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was a, a great overview and an introduction to the, to the session. For those of you who've been joining during that presentation, we're holding questions at the end. So please, please scribble down anything and keep it till later. Very pleased now to introduce the second speaker, Karen Barnes. And Karen is a global expert in malaria research, in particular the evaluation of malarial treatment policy and dosing regimes. She leads the Worldwide Anti-Malarial Resistance Network Pharmacology Group and serves as an advisor to several WHO expert groups on malaria. And she's going to talk about evident, is evidence production fit for purpose? So thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Jill. And it's a great opportunity to be here and to welcome you all to my hometown. I'm based at the University of Cape Town and I'm would like to share with you the experience we've gained with the Worldwide Anti-Malarial Resistance Network in trying to make sure that evidence is actually fit for purpose. And I'm going to focus on how we use individual patient data to inform malaria treatment policy and practice. Um, in terms of interests, these are interests to me and not conflicts of interest. Um, I benefit from working with the World Health Organization in developing guidelines. I benefit from developing um, aspects of the medicines formulary in South Africa and from doing research to understand what it's like to try and generate data that is fit for purpose. So the Worldwide Anti-Malarial Resistance Network, more fondly known as WARN, um, has a vision to try and provide the information that is necessary to prevent and alleviate anti-malarial drug resistance and therefore reduce malaria, morbidity and mortality. When we say worldwide, we really mean worldwide with over 260 partners across the globe and with centers based all over, including in Cape Town. WARN works to support the malaria research community um, by providing high quality analysis tools and most importantly for me, a platform for collaboration between the people that generate data, the people that use data. Um, in terms of the uptake of data sharing, we've included over 400 clinical trials on artemisinin and combination therapy and that's about 80% of the data that's currently available. So we've had a really good uptake within our community. Um, and the other real strength, I think, is its multidisciplinary nature, where we have interlinking, not siloed, modules of, of clinical work, molecular work, in vitro work, drug quality, and of course my passion, pharmacology. And the process that we use is to encourage everyone to benefit from use our data platform. So if you generate data, you can contribute it in whatever format you already have it, because we reckoned it would be a big obstacle to ask people to share data if they had to reformat it for our purpose. We link whatever data is available, and then we use our chassis to generate data in a more standardized format that can be reused by anyone with interest in using it, and it provides a legal, secure framework that's flexible enough both to generate up-to-date maps of the state of anti-malarial drug resistance globally, as well as scientific reports which can guide publications, policy documents. So how do we fit in with the evidence ecosystem? Why was I asked to be on this rather daunting platform with the big auditorium ahead of me. Well, most of our work focuses on the top half of the evidence ecosystem that Chris introduced you to. So starting at nine o'clock, ours is a network, an inclusive network that welcomes anyone with an interest in malaria research, the people that produce the evidence and the tools. And with that platform, we can synthesize the evidence that is contributed. Other people can also access that data through our data access committee 
which is independently based at WHO's TDR center. The data that we, or the evidence that we synthesize, we follow the PRISMA guidelines to make sure of what the risk of bias is in the data. We follow the FAIR guidelines of making data findable, accessible, um, interoperable, reusable, so that anyone who accesses our data access committee can use the data that they might want to answer questions that are of public health relevance. So far, a lot of our work has had impact on the World Health Organization's malaria treatment guidelines. And I think that's been a particular focus to try and answer questions that are most worrying to policymakers at global and national levels. The World Health Organization has technical expert groups and evidence review groups that work with Cochrane with graded data to try and inform ministries of health and clinicians as to what the best policies would be, what anti-malarial drugs should be available on essential medicines list. And through this data sharing platform, we can also identify where there are challenges, where people are not collecting the most needed data, or perhaps data that's not of the ideal quality, or that's not directly relevant. So then we can provide tools and feedback, and then we start again here with better quality data to continue this cycle. We have played a lesser role in the bottom half of the ecosystem. So WARN was started to be speaking, we started speaking about developing WARN way back in 2004, and we got our first grant in 2007. And this was really timely because this was exactly the time that artemisinin resistance raised its ugly head in Cambodia, the epicenter of anti-malarial drug resistance. And the resistance has since spread across Southeast Asia to six countries, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, China, Vietnam. And there's a real fear that this resistance will continue to spread. There have been isolated reports from across Africa of artemisinin and resistance. So it's really cl critical that we have a platform where people can know quickly what drugs are working, which drugs are not working, and how to deal with that. We also want to make sure that we use data to try and prevent or at least alleviate the harm of anti-malarial drug resistance. You don't want to be the depressing group that just says, yes, we've lost another drug, oh dear. We want to be the group that picks things up early and does something about it. So we link all of the groups within WARN to try and identify the factors that promote anti-malarial drug resistance. We try and make sure that people treated with the currently available drugs get them at the right dose, and we try and encourage researchers to target their research or interventions where they're most needed. So in the little bit of time left, I'd like to give you a few examples. One of the things WARN has developed is something called smart surveillance. And currently, this is being used in Southeast Asia, where they're trying to have a three-month time period between when a blood sample is collected from a patient and when policymakers can look at a map and know how much drug resistance there is and also know where are the gaps in their evidence. There's some places where they're very confident about the level of resistance, whether it's high or low. There are other places where there's too little data, and so you know that's where we need to investigate further. We're starting another pilot in Southern Africa at the moment, where we're trying to link notification data from each individual malaria case with molecular markers of resistance that are um, collected at a, or assayed in a national laboratory. So as a patient is seen by a healthcare worker in a clinic, they use their mobile phone to notify that case. It's linked to molecular markers of resistance. And if we're unfortunate enough to have the next case of artemisinin resistance emerging in Southern Africa, we can say it was this patient over here, we know where to find them, and we know where we need to target our containment efforts. We've also had the opportunity of pooling data from many, many studies to try and answer who are the patients that are at highest risk of treatment failure. One of the first was our dihydroartemisinin and paperiquin study group. 
which found that generally this treatment was highly effective and cured almost 98% of patients. But we also found because by pooling this data we had enough young children aged one to four years, we could see that these very young children had a fourfold higher risk of treatment failure and they're the most vulnerable group in, um, with malaria. We also looked at pharmacology data on drug concentrations and we found that the problem was that those young children also had the lowest drug concentrations, so we needed to do something to get their dose right. We used pharmacometric modeling led by the group in Bangkok, the Myodol Ox Oxford group. They came up with an optimized regimen which was adopted by the World Health Organization's malaria treatment guidelines. And this has now been shortlisted for the Time Higher Education Awards for something that's had been a real public health good. Artemetha lumefantrine is probably our most widely used anti-malarial drug. And we've had a similar study group to try and understand of all the data available in almost 3,000 patients, who are the people that might not be getting the right dose? Because if you don't get the right dose, you could foster resistance and shorten the useful therapeutic life of your drug. And here we found that very young children under the age of three years, particularly if they were malnourished, were the most vulnerable group. And this is a real concern for us because in the malaria endemic areas of the world, almost one third of children are malnourished. So we've now targeted interventions. We're doing a systematic review to try and understand interactions between malaria and malnutrition. And we're also busy with the individual patient data analysis to try and understand what the problems are and how we can solve them. So we've been in this game of um, trying to provide a data platform for malaria researchers now for almost 10 years. And in this time, there's been a lot of success, I hope you've been persuaded, and a number of challenges. And I think the three foremost challenges are firstly loss of data. Quite often, we'll do a literature review, ask people to share data with us, and they'll say, oh, I'd love to share the data with you, but I can't find it, my computer died, the student left. And so by creating a repository for secure long-term data storage, we not only benefit data sharing, but those researchers sometimes come back to us to ask for access to their own data because they've lost it when they had a flood or whatever. The next challenge we face, like everyone, is when you accept data in whatever format it is collected, you have problems with heterogeneity and with data quality. So a lot of our experiences have helped us hone our efforts about where we can help people most. So we've worked with CDISC and we facilitated the launch at the end of last year of CDISC standards, the first CDISC standards for malaria, which help people capture the right data using common terminology and give them the tools to make that much easier. And that's not only important for research, but it's also critical for drug development because regulatory authorities like the American FDA will now only um, accept submissions if they're accompanied with raw data, individual patient data that adheres to these standards. So our desperate need for new drugs is supported by our helping the development of these CEDAS standards. We've also helped by having a reference material program, so all laboratories, I think 67 at the moment, can have easy access to quality assured um, reference materials and an external quality assurance program We've worked with the World Health Organization to develop guidelines about how drug concentrations should be measured in field studies. And I think for those of you who've ever been involved with creating data platforms, one of the big worries is the issue of the sustainability of that platform. Because people generally fund research, but providing a platform, even when funders and journals and regulators say there must be data sharing, is quite difficult to sustain. So Philippe Guerin, who's in the audience here, and colleagues have been really successful at attracting multiple longer-term funders. And we've also achieved economies of scale by starting to include other infectious diseases that are poverty-related on the same platform. 
under the umbrella of the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, or IDO. And so, so far, this has included visceral leishmaniasis, schistosomiasis, soil-transmitted um, helminths, Zika, Ebola. And lastly, we've had a big impact in terms of encouraging and enabling data sharing. And I think by being pioneers, before data sharing was required, we've um, got a few headaches and we've learned a, a number of lessons. And those have been summarized quite well by the Wellcome Trust. And there's been a good article in the New England Journal of Medicine about how to avoid the risk of just being a place where people can tick the box, dump their data, but it's not very useful. And through TDR, we also have a data access committee. So in summary, um, I think that I've shown that WARN is a collaborative network that is responsible data sharing platform. And I think it succeeds by being voluntary, participatory, builds capacity, and enhancing data quality. And because of that, we've been able to translate science into public health action in a number of um, environments. By having larger patient numbers, we've had greater power to be able to understand which patients are most vulnerable. We've increased the validity and the generalizability of our findings. And we've been able to ensure the efficacy of existing drugs by getting them dosed right and inform the process of developing new drugs. So I hope I've persuaded you that WARN helps evidence to be produced, that the evidence that is produced to be fit for purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for a brilliant example of how uh, very poor people, malnourished children, and treatment of malaria can be helped by sharing data. Uh, I think this can serve as a good example for what is coming up as an evidence ecosystem. Now I have a great pleasure in introducing Greg Onkrik, who is a general internal medicine doctor and serves as an interim senior associate dean for medical education at JSL School of Medicine at Dartmouth and is Associate Chief of Staff for Education at the White River uh, Junction Veterans Hospital in Vermont, USA. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He is lead author of the Fundamental of Healthcare Improvement textbook that introduces the basics of quality improvement methods, and he is also the co-investigator for the revision of the standards for quality improvement reporting excellence guidelines, a set of publication guidelines for sharing quality improvement work through published literature. I have great uh, pleasure in inviting Greg to talk on quality improvers up to the speed in the ecosystem. Greg, please. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction. Thank you to the chairs and to the committee for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm going to talk about building knowledge of local systems. So we're actually going to be moving from the generation and the dissemination of big data and evidence to more about how it's used on the uh, front lines. Uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest. Uh, I do will mention that the Squire 2.0 guidelines uh, was funded by the Health Foundation in the UK and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the US. The next 15 minutes or so, there are three objectives I'd like to cover. Uh, first is to be able to explore the methods healthcare providers use to create local change in systems and to be able to introduce you and talk about some of the QI methods that are used. Um, especially describing the relationship between the creating of evidence and the using of evidence and how that begins to come together for folks who are at the front lines delivering care. And at the end, I also want to introduce the Squire guidelines for reporting systematic efforts to improve quality, safety, and value of healthcare services um, because I think it, it fits into the uh, ecosystem as a way to feed back into the, uh, the data. Um, over the past day and a half that I've been here and attending the session, there's so many exciting um, innovations with rapid recs and different ways to, to move evidence into practice. What I want to start with is a, a story, a case story about actually a mismatch of this, a mismatch of the data 
and the frontline providers. So this is an article from uh, now about 11 years ago uh, from the New England Journal, Intervention to Decrease Catheter-Related Bloodstream Infections in the ICU. Um, now for those of you who may not be clinically prepared, this is deals with bloodstream infections that happen from large bore catheters. These are the catheters that are often uh, used in the neck, uh, in the subclavian vein, or sometimes in the groin, in the femoral vein. And they carry with them a particular risk of a bacterial infection when they're used. Now, <clears throat> this study um, was done by Peter Pronovost and his group. Um, this is, for those of us in uh, hospital-based medicine, this is actually a really famous study. This is one we use and we quote often. It's, um, and the intervention here was nothing fancy. This wasn't an intervention of a antibiotic impregnated catheter or anything like that. This was an intervention of a checklist. And the checklist had five things on it. It had uh, cleanse your hands before you start the procedure, wear full body protection uh, and barrier, um, use chlorhexidine to cleanse the skin, um, don't use the femoral site because of the bacterial load and the increased risk of infection. And lastly, the fifth thing on the checklist was to monitor the IV line and to take it out when it's not needed. Now, what's important about this also, it's also, also this is also called the Keystone Study. It's also called the Michigan Study. Um, the setting here is quite important. So um, this is Michigan. So uh, geography is important. So Michigan actually sits right here in the U.S. It's bordered by Canada. And when you look at a up, up close of it, uh, Detroit, Michigan is down here, which is probably its most notable city. And it has a lower peninsula, and it has an upper peninsula. And as you can see, it's a, it's a great lake state. It's surrounded by um, all of the great lakes. So this is actually really important when we analyze uh, what actually happened in this study. Now, the results from here are really impressive. This is the data table from the article. And what I draw your attention to is the baseline rate here. Now, this is 2.7. So there were 2.7 infections per 1,000 catheter days. And 1,000 catheter days is how they normalize the exposure to the catheter. So if I have a catheter in for five days, I would contribute five catheter days to that. And as you look at the baseline data, you see it's 2.7 the, uh, is the median. There's an interquartile range. And whether it's a teaching hospital, a non-teaching hospital, smaller or larger hospital, you can see the range there is all sort of 2.1 to 2.7. Now what's so impressive by this is as they introduce this checklist, as you go down this column of overall results, um, it went from 1.6 to 0, and then the median stayed at 0 over the 18 months of starting this. And if you scan across the slide in any of those categories, whether it's teaching or non-teaching, smaller, larger, the uh, median all got to zero. Tremendous results. Incredibly exciting, well done study, published in a top journal. But if you're at the front lines of care, these are the questions that you ask. Like, all right, okay, well, what actually happened? And most importantly, I think, are the second two questions is, how can I get these good results in my ICU? Can I get these, re can I get these results? And so the story continues with this. And several years later, this is now 2009. This is an article in The Lancet that was called Reality Check for Checklists. And this wasn't a headline article. This wasn't a research article. This was in the perspectives section. But what Bosk and uh, Mary Dixon Woods and Peter Pronovost was a co-author on this, they said the Keystone study story was oversimplified. And they lament the fact that checklists haven't made the difference that they thought they would make. And they say the reasons are cultural and social. And look what they say. They say a technical solution, a checklist, is being used to solve an adaptive, a socio-cultural problem. Now when I I use this story and I teach medical students and, and training physicians, they sort of look at me sideways and they say, I didn't go into medicine to solve cultural problems. I went in for science. Tell me about the science. And they say the checklist obscures the complex labor necessary to create faith in the checklist. And then they say, you know what? There are five things we didn't really even talk about in our article. There's local leadership from administration, safety and improvement training, the sound measurement for infections, 
If you ever hear Peter Pronovos talk about this work, he is passionate about getting that measurement right to make the improvement more effective. Feedback from all frontline professionals. And look at this last one. There wasn't one checklist. It says there were more than 100 checklists, the ability to modify for local use. Now, I would submit to you that if you send an article to the New England Journal and you say, well, our intervention wasn't one intervention. We really had 100 different interventions, and it changed, and everybody modified it. It's not going to be looked at as favorably as the science. But this is the important stuff if I'm on the front lines. Three years later, 2011, Mary Dixon Woods, Charles Bosk, Peter Pronovost, they're still trying to explain Michigan. This is a much longer article in Milbank. This is 30 or 35 page article. And they say QI studies are remarkably poor at describing exactly what a program comprises. And they are still trying to explain what happened in Michigan. And look at the words they used to describe it. They generated pressure to join, a densely networked community, a social problem, interventions that shaped a culture of commitment, this last two, harness data as a disciplinary force and use hard edges, the checklist itself. When you read this list, this was not someone walking into an ICU, handing a checklist and walking away and say, okay, we're all done here. It's a checklist must work. There was so much important, difficult, hard work at each of those ICUs. So we have excellent evidence, but the evidence is only part of the story of how to make it work and how to make it happen in practice. And the real evidence, the helpful things for my ICU or my clinic or my hospital ward really came in these follow-up articles. And this is where I think the evidence ecosystem can be part is particularly helpful because as we look at this and, and Chris uh, introduced all the parts of this um, Karen gave some excellent examples from the malarial work, but it's this part, this lower part, kind of from the 5 o'clock to 7 and 8 o'clock part of this dial that I think is the, the, perhaps the most underdeveloped because I don't think we have the best and the right information or the right methods to even help develop this. Now, if you look at this part in the lower uh, left-hand corner about improving practice. I think there's a lot of confusion about what goes into this. And <clears throat> I want to do is uh, say a word about what is quality improvement and how does it happen and how does it connect to evidence. There are a lot of definitions of quality improvement. This is the one that I prefer the most. This is from uh, Paul Batalden and Frank Davidoff from 2007. <clears throat> and they describe quality improvement as the combined and unceasing efforts of everyone. And take a look at this list. Professionals, patients and families, researchers, administrators, planners, payers, educators, to make changes that lead to three things. Patient outcome, certainly important, always at the top of our list. But equally important, making the system work better, excellent care at a lower cost, better access for more patients, and better professional development. Professional development and how we uh, develop our nurses and doctors and pharmacists and administrators is actually part of quality improvement. Now, when you think of quality improvement, sometimes you think of the programs that make it happen. So there's Lean and there's Six Sigma. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement uses the model for improvement. And I think those can be confusing. So I prefer this definition because it's a little bit more broad. But how is it done, and how does, how does this evidence uh, and improvement uh, work to, and come together? This is from the same article by Batalin and Davidoff. It's the evidence-based improvement formula. And what it does is it describes these five knowledge domains that need to come together at the front lines of care. And so let me walk you through each of these. The first one is the one that we are all most comfortable with generalizable scientific knowledge. You look at the study design, you have statistics, you build your systematic reviews and guidelines, and there is a hope that if we build enough evidence that will lead to measurable performance improvement. 
but there's other knowledge and other skills that are needed. You need to know something about the context. This gets into our systems, our processes, the people, the digital environment. We saw a great example of this in, that Karen just showed with the digital environment with it in Belgium in the, with the um, uh, lactobacillus prescribing. That's part of that particular context. That's very different than for me in the veterans hospital in the US which is different from the hospital across the street, the university hospital. Measurable performance improvement is balanced system level measurement. You get into the costs and you think about the patient factors and satisfaction with care and the professional satisfaction. What is particularly strong about this model is the plus sign and the arrow. You can have the right evidence, you can know something about the system. If you don't know how to align those, and bring those together and couple them in your system, you will be less successful. And lastly is the arrow. The arrow is the part I think we all forget. We sort of hope it happens, but there is skill and there's knowledge in executing and managing change at the front lines of care. And we saw this in the Michigan study. This wasn't just a matter of handing a checklist and making it happen. There was real work happening at each of those ICUs. So let's return to Michigan. So I showed you this picture of the, the nice colored map before. This is now just an outline. And what, ha what was happening in this? What was happening at all those ICUs is this. So this is that evidence-based improvement equation, uh, not at 105 ICUs, but at many of the ICUs. And you begin to see that in the urban and the rural and the larger hospitals and smaller hospitals, they were ta the evidence didn't change. The checklist was the same, the hand hygiene was the same, but how they moved it into practice was different. And the authors and the researchers acknowledged that later in their work. But what was so powerful about the work and was excellent about the work that Pronovos did was this, is that they actually studied the improvement. And they said, how do you know the results were from your changes? Well, they studied that and they collected it and they went back years after to talk to the ICUs to pull out all of those things. They were looking at the improvement from afar. This is actually what improvers don't do very well. Improvers get so focused on what they're doing locally, they don't do a great job of studying it. And so what we end up with is this very rich, detailed set of quantitative data but then later comes this other work, these other tips that in some ways for me at my ICU, trying to make this happen are much more helpful. So we return back to the ecosystem and um, as you're learning and working to implement evidence and to make evidence work in your setting, um, there's this little piece here, this data, there's data at every arrow and this one I think is particularly challenging because as I, as I said, improvers who are doing this aren't necessarily focused on moving things forward. But there are guidelines and there are ways to share data publicly through the published literature. So um, these are the standards for uh, quality improvement reporting excellence. It's a set of publication guidelines that offer guidance on reporting original studies of improvement. And Squire is intended to acknowledge the context dependent, the complexity, the iterative nature of the work, the fact that that checklist changes all the time, that's actually okay. And that needs to be reported because when you're trying to implement this at your site, you need to know that. It's measuring the impact and the discovery and an explanation of mechanisms. And we have a website and you can follow us on Twitter if you like also. Lastly, just as a summary, Improving local systems involves applying evidence to the local context. And there are many different methods used to improve quality, safety, and value of healthcare services. Lots of different ways to make it happen. But studying these interventions in QI is challenging. And I don't think we, we have not yet fully developed the methods and the skills um, to study and to share these data and to complete that cycle of the evidence ecosystem. Thank you.
Thanks for that. A really good example of the challenges of changing practice and all the various players that you have to get to work together to, to make something happen. And clearly, we need that local leadership. You had it on one of your slides. Without somebody to uh, take the data and infuse everyone, it's really difficult to, to make things happen at the end of the day. So the final speaker this morning, I'm pleased to introduce Jonathan Sharples who is an expert in brain science research and is a senior researcher at the Education Endowment Foundation. And the EEF is one of a series of what works centers that the UK government has set up. And the EEF, I, I like to think, is, is a shining example of those what works centers and has done an awful lot to develop evidence and put it into practice. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentation about the ecosystem of evidence for education. Great, thank you. And thank you everyone and hi. Uh, it uh, really is a pleasure to be here and, um, and get a chance to talk about, um, <coughs> about our work. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this concept of evidence um, systems plays out in our world in, in education. Um, I'm based at, at the Institute of Education at, at University College in London. Um, but I spend most of my time working at this organization, the Education Endowment Foundation. And, and I don't have any conflict of interest um, in, relation to this, um, in relation to this presentation. So the, um, the Education Endowment Foundation, the EEF as it gets uh, called, um, we're an independent body um, established in um, 2011 with a large grant um, from government, £135 million, pounds, to try and... Um, essentially capture and spread evidence and insights around to how to raise um, the achievement and attainment of pupils from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, as, um, as we said, we are part of a network of uh, what are called What Works Centres, um, sit as a, what's called the What Works Network, which are nine um, centres covering different areas of public policy established to, to create, share and use high quality evidence to inform decision making. And, uh, as part of another conversation, it's quite interesting to think about what's been the policy context by which these centres have, have emerged. It's reasonably, reasonably recent development, and you know, it would be interesting to talk about how, what, what's created that context at, at policy level. So I was delighted to come, be asked to come and talk about um, evidence systems. We've been talking and trying to promote and, and develop this idea of thinking in a more systems-based way for, for a while now in education. But, but what I didn't expect was quite how similar those, um, those systems were going to, to be. Um, so this, um, this represents the system, the evidence system um, which we work in. Um, and if you just sort of swing it around, flip it, that took me far too long on PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> If you swing it around and take it around, you essentially see that, that, that you've got the same um, elements in the same kind of configuration. So there are activities relation to, to innovation and, um, and frontline um, development, primary research and evaluation, secondary synthesis, that information being translated, disseminated and used, which hopefully acts as a foundation for further innovation. And you know, there's either an interesting convergence in ideas here, or we're both walking hand in hand off in the wrong direction. You know? And, and I, I, I do think it is the, is the former. Um, and and it, it is significant, this, this, this similarity. We're involved in a study looking at evidence um, centers in different systems at the moment. And they certainly don't always share these elements in this, um, in the, in this kind of way. So some of these centers are focusing more. Um, the dissemination activities and the, and the use activities are more on individual studies. So they're not necessarily using synthesis and reviews as a foundation for that, um, um, for that dissemination activities. Likewise, there aren't always um, processes in place for the use of an application of that evidence to be the foundation for further innovation. So you know, we talk about this concept of disciplined innovation, where that use of evidence is the basis of that further innovation, and that's not always um, in place. So, you know, I, th I, think, I think we're onto, onto something around, around this kind of conceptual model. It also gives us a language to be able to compare and talk and share ideas in, re in relation to into different themes. And that's been a real fruitful process over the last um, a couple of years, talking with colleagues in healthcare. Where the, where the big difference comes um, is that, and I guess this is unusual, I, I increasingly realise, is that we as a single organisation are involved in each element of that evidence system. 
We don't, we don't do it all. Um, we work with probably up to about 100 different organisations, but the Education Endowment Foundation acts as the coordinating body across that um, evidence system. And, um, and I think that, you know, there, there's some downsides to that, there's some challenges around to that. I think the main challenge is just around capacity. You know, one organisation trying to coordinate a whole system in this kind of way and there are limits to what we can achieve. We only have 20 people in, in this organisation, even though, as I say, we're working with, with many, many more organisations externally. So I think that's the main disadvantage. The, the advantages, I think, though, you know, are, are numerous that come out of this. The first is that by involving all the systems, it enables us to be strategic at that system level. So when we started, it felt as though the limiting factor for us in, in our world was this throughput of useful evidence. You know, you can't have an evidence center in it if you haven't got this useful throughput of evidence coming through. So we focused the first five years of, of our kind of work predominantly on kind of kick-starting that evidence engine and focusing on that left-hand side of that process. So um, we'd, we've funded lots and lots of different projects, looking at lots of different interventions across lots of different areas of, of teaching and learning, then commissioning um, independent evaluations of that work, which, which can then be synthesized. So we spent a lot of effort on that initially. Now moving forward, as that evidence is moving, we're still going to keep that going. We can focus, and, and the plan is to focus much more on the dissemination and, and, the, and the use of, of that work. The second um, kind of advantage, which is... I guess related to that, is that by being involved in all the evidence of these systems, it facilitates more naturally linking across those different elements. So, so for example, if we are entering into a new area of work, um, we've just done some work around marking practices in schools, we'll commission a review as the foundation before we start that piece of work. Inevitably, that all throws up a lots of different evidence gaps and kind of weaknesses in the evidence base. And we immediately can open then a call for projects, you know, we can put some money on the table and say, right, come to us as a sector with ideas that can address those evidence gaps. We can commission evaluations and get that evidence base um, um, starting to, to develop. Um, it, it can also work the other way. So as we get trends of findings emerging from, from our evaluations, we can start seeing ahead in terms of where is there opportunities here to do guidance, and even where are there opportunities to start building the capacity within the profession to start using that information. So it, um, I think, and I do think we take some of those um, links for, uh, for granted. I think the third advantage is that we've been able to kind of control a little bit more and standardize the methods of engagement and the terms of engagement with this system. Um, you, know, you, you may know in education there's been a reluctance, to put it mildly, to do experimental evaluations and to do quantitative evaluations. And, and there's been a lot of, I, I think that's been a big hamper of progress in, in the past. And when we started, we kind of almost set our stall out and said, right, where possible, we're going to conduct large-scale mixed methods evaluations involving randomized trials, if, if, if that's feasible, and implementation and process evaluation. So we're doing qualitative and quantitative work. That's it. That's our modus operandi, and that's how we're going to um, do it. All our evaluations are independent. We completely decouple the development from the, in, from the evaluation. And again, that's just a kind of red line that we won't, um, we won't cross. And as a result of that, I think it's been easier to make progress. We've been able to kind of get this process moving without necessarily having to get consensus from the whole community at times. And, um, you know, I, th there are some risks, I think. You can get these institutional blind spots as involved in working with all those stages. But um, I've been impressed that the organisation has been it's quite nimble in responding to um, challenge and, and kind of adapting and, and integrating that into how it works. Um, I guess the, the final thing that, that, that comes out of that is that by being involved in, by being able to kind of develop um, the system itself, paradoxically, I think you're able to disturb the wider system. So, you know, we've, we've funded something like 145 projects in the last six years, almost all involving randomized trials. Um, that now involves over a third of all schools nationally in the UK, so something like 10,000 schools are involved in, in one of those trials, nearly a million pupils. So, you know, the idea that, that five years ago that would be the case just wouldn't have ever happened. People said trials are unethical, schools won't get involved, they're too long, they're too expensive. And it's just not borne out to be true. And the way in which the profession has got involved in this endeavour 
both as involved in the research projects, but also in leading a lot of the developments. You know, our, our best projects are our school-led projects on, on many di different dimensions. So the, the, the way in which the profession has got involved in that, I think the overarching thing has shifted the thinking around how research and evaluation can take place in education, certainly in, in the UK. So that's, that's the kind of the, the, the idea. So I'll just, the last sort of five minutes, just give you a, a kind of example of how this has worked um, in practice. So we create a resource called the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, um, which I once heard a teacher describe as a witch magazine for education research. Um, I think all you can have consumer reports in, in the US, and it's a meta-meta analysis. Um, so it's a synthesis of around about 10,000 studies, um, which are displayed on one, um, you can see on one kind of screen here, really, and there's too much to talk about it now. But essentially, you have a whole range of different teaching strategies, aspects of school organisations, a whole range of things we do in schools. Then you have evidence, information on the cost, the confidence of the evidence, and the average... Um, impact that interventions in this area have been, have been shown to make. And this has been a bit of a game changer, really, um, you know, with the majority of heads reporting using this resource in some way. We don't know enough about what use is, but it, it's, certainly, um, it's certainly been a, a widely adopted, a widely adopted um, a resource, and you can dig into it and get lots and lots more detailed information. The reason I mention it is um, um, when we published it, the area that probably got the most kickback was this entry around teaching assistance. Um, teaching assistants are, as the name suggests, ad additional adults in the classroom who are there to support the, the teacher. Um, there's no formal qualifications around teaching assistants, but um, they, and so they vary just dramatically in their kind of background. But the evidence, as you can see here, suggests they were an expensive, reasonably expensive resource, um, certainly not enough research on it. And when we published it, it's actually changed since we published it, suggesting they weren't adding to the... Um, uh, the, the outcomes, the learning outcomes of pupils in schools and actually were potentially having a negative impact at times when they were poorly deployed. That's particularly relevant when, when you look at the number of teaching assistants in the UK system, um, similar to the size of the nursing profession in the NHS. Um, um, there are more TAs than teachers and we're spending around about £5 billion pounds a year, equivalent to the road, social housing. So there's a massive resource here that, um, that we're talking about. So it's an area that we've been interested in doing something about. Let's see if we can you know, improve the way that teaching assistants are deployed and understand a little bit more about them. Um, and to cut a long, expensive, extensive research story short, um, we've published um, eight trials now involving teaching assistants delivering... Um, been trained much more uh, to deliver specific structured interventions in literacy and numeracy. And out of those eight trials, seven have shown not just positive effects, but very, very similar, similar impacts. So if you look at that column to the second to the right, the effect sizes largely landed between 0.2 and 0.3. So that's an unusually kind of convergent set of findings. Um, you know, typically about 20 or 30% of our trials might show an impact. So this is kind of a bit of an outlier. So... We, this was the foundation for our first guidance report, so this was kind of getting off the fence, if you like, um, and saying, at this moment in time, this is what an evidence-informed um, picture of what um, um, teaching, effective teaching dis um, deployment looks like. We took those trials, we integrated them into the wider evidence base, and then we interpreted them in terms of these seven recommendations around um, teaching assistant deployment. And this has been a kind of foundation for a big campaign on this issue, involving a whole range of different strategies to try and get this guidance out um, and used in schools, everything from just direct communications, so we sent a copy of this to every school, policy levers we've, we've, we've tried to, to use, a whole range of different um, um, strategies. Um, alongside of it, there's a set of digital resources to help people um, not just with the what, but I think it relates to what you were saying, Greg, with actually um, engaging with this in terms of trying to implement it. So these are all resources to support implementation. So there are audit tools to review current practice. Um, there are kind of red, amber, green self-assessments where you can look at your performance in relation to these recommendations. There's an online course that's been downloaded 100,000 100, times and to kind of with case study videos that exemplify what these principles look like. And, and, and we've been surprised on the, on the kind of the appetite, if you like, for those, um, those implementation resources. Um, 
we, my, area, my area, actually, area of interest in research is on knowledge mobilization. So how do we get research used? So I focus on the kind of latest bits of this um, system. And it's an area where we don't know enough. We certainly don't. But, um, but we know some things about what are probably unlikely to work. And just packaging it up, making it look nice, and kicking it out of the door by itself is probably unlikely to make a difference. Um, so we've been trying to think, well, how do you build on this kind of base of, of, of activity to, pr to provide more kind of active engagement to, to try and bring it to life? Um, so one of the things that we've been um, trying in this case was recruiting partners. So these are, pr these are practitioners, essentially, um, um, a whole range of different people in local authorities, um, a whole range of different bodies. We're, we're a very heterogeneous system now in the UK, but um, we've been working with a variety of different practice partners across 11 regions of the UK, essentially to try and bring this evidence to life. And they've run conferences, workshops, a um, whole range of different kind of planning activities, school visits, essentially trying to support this implementation um, and process. And I think... What's been quite um, informative is here, I mean, Jeremy's here at the front, Susan, Mickey's work and others, is that thinking about what, what's the additional role of the profession in motivating colleagues, providing the opportunities to engage with this evidence and developing the skills to be able to do something with this. So in other words, not just focusing on the evidence and, and what you do to disseminate, disseminate it, but also focusing on the behavioural requirements of, of the profession to be able to do something with that. And this has been quite significant in changing how we think about this work. You know, we can back it up in terms of interventions, but um, you, you, we need to bring this to life um, by working through the profession. Just, just finally, I mean, uh, this might be part of something for the discussion. We're very aware that our system, you know, sits within other evidence systems. Um, we're also aware that those evidence systems sit within a whole range of other systems. So in the UK, you know, in, in education, we have funding systems, accountability systems, school improvement systems, policy systems, a whole range of other systems. What my, my colleague David Goff has referred to as the swamp. <laughs> and, you know, and, and Alan Bestworks talks about the effectiveness and viability of these systems as a function of how well the evidence system integrates with those wider systems. So, you know, and, and there's some big fish swimming around in this, in this um, swamp that will gobble up those evidence systems. So we have to think about how we create, you know, durable symbiotic relationships between, between the evidence systems and all these wider systems for this, this, this um, work to really get traction um, on a, on a long-term basis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Really interesting to see how, educate, how evidence works in a non-health environment. So I'm just standing here for a moment. Per is going to join us on the panel, and I think everybody probably knows who you are. But just in case not, would you mind introducing yourself for a couple of moments? And do we get the lights up at this point so that everybody's woken up and ready to ans ask questions? Per. <coughs> Yes, I'm Per Ulla Van Wyk, I'm based in Oslo, Norway. I've had the pleasure of uh, somewhat orchestrating this evidence ecosystem effort, also behind Magic, Magic App. Um. Thank you, that's, that's great. So, we've got microphones in the aisles, I can see. And we've got 15 minutes for questions. So, please do start to form orderly queues, and we can take your questions in turn and I'm very much hoping there will be some orderly cues but I've got a backup question just in in case I can see somebody coming to the microphone here I think yep would you would you like to kick off hi I'm Trish um, a question for Jonathan really enjoyed your presentation about school education and I noticed that out of this very large amount of money that you've got out of the UK government, is it 135 million? Very, you know, respect. Um, you spent a lot of that on randomized controlled trials, and then you talked about an ecosystem in which you linked that to uh, basically implementation. Um, my experience of doing research into education is that the younger the learner, the more easy it is to do a randomized trial, 
or the earlier in the learning process. So you can, you can randomize five-year-olds very easily to different educational methods, etc. But once you get to what we call post-experience learners, doctors, nurses, etc., who are, work, who are you know, learning in, in the later stages of their careers, randomized trials become more and more difficult to do. So I just wanted you to comment on, your, on the fact that you know, you're, you're doing randomized trials, but others who are doing research into the learning process may not be practically able to do that. Hi, yeah, thanks. It's a good, really good question. I mean, we're, we're aided. I, I guess the, the, um, we're aided dramatically um, to be able to do these trials by the fact we have an anonymized national pupil database. Yeah. Um, so so a, lot of these, a lot of these projects, we can collect data. We have a very clear kind of objective in t improving outcomes for disadvantaged pupils. There are national tests on these. That, that data can be collected anonymously, which basically enables us to do a lot of these trials without a huge amounts of additional um, testing. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big um, facilitator for being able to do this um, for, the, for this process. Um, but you know, th these are complex um, issues and kind of pedagogies that we're trying to, to capture. And I think it's one of the lessons that, that we've learned is perhaps when we started um, we were doing perhaps more what you, you know, black box kind of evaluations where we'd, we'd get an output, but we wouldn't really know what had been going on underneath the, the bonnet. And the big area of development for us really over the last three or four years has been developing more sophisticated implementation and process evaluations yeah. that blend qualitative and quantitative methods. So you know, we've done a lot more work on doing initial theory of change. We found that incredibly useful. It's amazing, you know, you, uh, someone's developed a program all their life and they stand so close to it, they don't know what's, what they think is driving the effects. So, you know, I would recommend doing that, is sitting down and really working through in a lot of detail what, what are the different elements and mechanisms within your intervention that you think is driving that effect. And then trying to build an evaluation around that with a range of different methods that try and follow that chain of, um, of, of action through to whatever outcomes you're, you're seeing. But yeah, I, these, are, you know, these are complex interventions, often with lots of moving parts. Um, and I say we're, we're facilitated that, that we have this kind of end point that is actually quite a hard measure that's available for us to use. But it's can the I, stuff in between. Yeah. Can I just respond to that? I, sure. I, I agree with you. I suppose what I would say is that you're in a, in a privileged position being able to randomize your database of kids. Yeah. I would say that everything you've said about the evidence ecosystem would also apply even if the research method that you were using to look at the educational intervention was not a randomized controlled trial. That's my point. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to have some order, can we go clockwise, maybe here and then you next and then behind? Hi, my question is for Chris. Um, I'm a trainee psychiatrist and so the vision of uh, pop-ups of best evidence when you're prescribing something was an exciting vision. But thinking about unintended consequences, there were two that came to my mind. One was about um, erosion of clinical clinician autonomy or um, potential even automization of the clinician, clinician's role in the extreme and how clinicians would feel about that. And secondly, um, thinking about the Amazon world in which we're suggested to buy other things when we buy something uh, and the, you know, the money to be made from the drug industry. Is there a danger that, especially in areas where there's not a huge amount of concrete evidence that um, powerful players that have an interest in upselling, say, probiotics, for example, uh, might have more power than uh, we would like in terms of clinical prescribing decisions? I, I'll answer part of that and then I might defer to Pear or someone with more clinical. Um, I'm, the, I'm the tech guy, so I'm just interested in making uh, work what, what um, you know, socially and clinically is, is, uh, is, is, is recommended. Um, but yeah, I completely see what, what you're saying and I think what worries me is I mean, in our particular pipeline, we, we think it's based on rigorous evidence that's been synthesized using proper methods. And what worries me are the more the kind of IBM Watson uh, big data mining people who are just going to recommend things 
you know, perhaps not based on rigorous um, evidence, but, but in terms of the, the automation of, of clinicians and then that clinical encounter, maybe Greg or other folks here on the panel that, that would have more to say about that than me. I, I'm really interested in, in facilitating the flow of data, and, um, but the context, and to Greg's point about how you actually do it in the, at the point of care is, uh, is obviously critical. I agree with you. A anyone else would like to take up? Yeah, okay. Oh, that's a great point. And we, one thing we know about decision support systems in the HR, they're fraught with problems. We know about reminder and alert fatigue. The way of pushing evidence in that way is, is highly problematic in terms of current best evidence. So we're looking at better ways of just displaying uh, trustworthy recommendations and evidence in the HR linked to patient data. And I think the example you saw was uh, an example of kind of traditional decision support with a reminder. Um, in this case, I don't think it was a conflict of interest in the, on behalf of industry, et cetera, but definitely this field warrants a tight link between those producing evidence and disseminating evidence with the medical informatics society who tend to ignore what we do in their efforts. So a lot of work to be done. There's a threaded session to going into depth in this one um, later today. Okay, then, then, yeah. My name is Craig Umshad from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, similar to Greg, my, my background is evidence-based practice, quality improvement, hospital medicine. And uh, I just wanted to offer a tweak to the uh, current ecosystem cycle that was used in many of the slides. I thought all of your presentations were great, but uh, this one tweak I think is really important. And it's this idea that in this cycle it looks like um, we're uh, doing systematic reviews and, and guidelines uh, to physicians and to patients rather than having bi-directional communication. So physicians and patients informing the development of evidence, the development of re reviews, the development of guidelines. So I'd, I just suggest rethinking that model a bit, and I'm usually averse to models, but they're so important in directing our strategy forward. So I would just recommend thinking about that a bit as we think about all the tools that Cochrane's developing to, to make this happen. Yeah. So Anybody? Just, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, so I, I think that's actually a, a really good point. Um, and some of the newer uh, work in quality improvement, it really talks about the co-production of healthcare and the work of patients and providers and families and communities together deciding on what's important for the health of that community or the health of that patient. And that is certainly much more of a, of a, a two-way street and a, a partnership and network between the local healthcare delivery microsystem and the patients that they serve. And so um, I think that's a good point that you make. And that, that actually speaks to a lot of uh, some of the newer, I think, developments in uh, improvement work also. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, Chris. Uh, yeah, just a really brief point to say that, yeah, completely. I mean, in Cochrane, we, we actively try to involve um, consumers and patients. Uh, I didn't really explain it well in my example, but the, the oral health group being involved with the guideline development and making sure that the, the, share, the, the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of, of, uh, of in, informing the way synthesis is done, you know, works both ways. So, but I think it's a good point. We could think about how we could have little kind of feedback loops in the loop if you will. Yeah, it's just this idea that instead of doing evidence-based practice to patients or clinicians, we do it with them. Yep. It's bi-directional. Thanks. Okay. And Per, did you want to comment too? Okay. <laughs> right. So it's great that the lights come up. We haven't got that no, much longer time. So, she yeah, I, yeah, she, she's, and I, I know. How many, who else is waiting to ask a question? Yeah, One. Comes back. Yeah. So we'll take those final two questions and that'll have to be the end of the session I'm afraid so if we go up there. Hi I just had a quick question I'm Carrie Koverig I'm also from the University of Pennsylvania this is for the malaria uh, study um, I'm just curious when you get a large amount of unstructured data from a site how you deal with that and putting it in your own format and how you uh, might approach them to start putting it in a more structured format. Thanks a really good question so it wasn't um, first prize for us, but we thought that in an environment where data sharing wasn't the norm, um, we didn't want to create any obstacles. 
And we were blessed with people like Chris who can use informatics to map data in a, into the core variables that we needed to determine the outcomes of interest um, from whatever data standard that they started with, provided they gave us good data dictionaries, good metadata, and it's a network, so we could have ongoing going communication with them if anything needed clarification. That was for retrospectively collected data. Now we're moving forward, and prospectively we're hoping that more and more people will adopt the many tools that we've developed, the CDISC standards that we've facilitated, and so hopefully with time the data that will be coming in will be more and more similar and eventually standardized. And I think it's been a good trade-off for us, a steep learning curve, and it wouldn't have been possible without IT support. And they're usually open to the suggestions? Um, I think that what's nice about a community and a network is you have a trusting relationship with each other. So you'll sometimes get pushback when we ask too much, and sometimes it's welcomed, particularly because we're never prescriptive and we always provide tools. So there'll be database templates, there'll be user guides, there'll be all sorts of ways of where people are given tools, so it's made easier for them to do it right. Thank you. For us to do it right, actually. Thank you, and final question. So my name is Ian Goldman. I'm head of the government evaluation system in, in South Africa and also sort of take, playing a key role in the evidence ecosystem. Jonathan, we've been, uh, but first of all, they were really excellent presentations. It's one of the best panels I've been to for a long time. Well done, all of you. So, Jonathan, we've been in contact with EEF, and but one of our one of our big challenges is around um, systematic reviewers, people working in research synthesis outside the medical field in South Africa. The the, every, it's, the concentration is in the medical field, and. How did you deal with that? And I'd also like to make a call to anybody in this room who's working in synthesis in South Africa that's not in the medical field, if they could contact me or my colleague Hersha, who's somewhere, I think, in here, and uh, because we'd really like to know about you. Because apart from Ruth Stewart's unit, there's very few people working outside the medical field. What's your experience and how have you, how have you dealt with it? And also, have you, has there been any work done to try and translate the experience of research synthesis in the medical field into the broader social and economic field? I mean, the, the, sim the first kind of simple answer to that is that we have the same problem. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, we, we've, we've managed to gather the, the few people that we think are, you know, or the few teams in reality, it's not people, the teams that are doing this, and we, we kind of grab them and, and, and don't let them go <laughs> um, as much as we can. But, um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. There is a, a, a lack of... Um, uh, a shortage, although there is there, you know, we have, I'm, I'm based at the epicenter at, um, at, at UCL and there's, there's a team there that can do, uh, doing reviews across a wide range of areas, um, you know, so, so there are people. We, ha we actually have one central, we have a, a, a group at Durham University um, who act as the kind of overarching coordinators of our synthesis, so they develop this teaching and learning toolkit, which is the kind of start and end of our, of our that's the anchor that acts, um, that, that brings everything together. So I'd recommend kind of trying to set up a long-term partnership with one group and using them. They do all our data archive work. They do a lot of our secondary synthesis and re-examination re of data and things like that. So I'd, I'd, I'd very much recommend that. And I think we, you know, we need to, to share uh, methods and learning as, as we're kind of going along. I, I, we found over the last two years working in this cross-sector way being really vibrant and really vital because you know, we, we've moved into this process of, say, doing guidance and you know we're, we're facing that issue you know it's, it's a very kind of practical so working with nice and with the college of policing and other centers within this what work network has been a really it's not been collaboration for the sake of collaboration it's been collaboration because tomorrow we have to do something in relation to this so i'd I, you know we i think we need more formal structures to support that cross-sector collaboration it still relies on serendipity i think a little bit too much and i think you know through things like this we could have some more specific cross-sector working groups that start addressing um, you know, c common methodological issues. But I, I, can, I, I can give you some names. <laughs> is, the, is the other answer? I uh, can see Professor Grimshaw at the microphone, and I think we might just give you a couple of minutes. I, I don't need a couple of minutes, but I, I just need to say there is a global organization that is doing synthesis in uh, social and, uh, and economic sectors, 
Um, we're small, but we're growing big, and we want to engage with people. That's the Campbell Collaboration. It's one of the five organizing partners. We should really sort of build upon, uh, and there's lots of already links with EEF and others, but we should be building on those relationships rather than thinking there isn't a lot out there. There's been quite a lot of activity. We need to do more, but let's all work together. Thank you. I think we all agree the speakers have done an excellent job in covering all aspects of the evidence ecosystem and really bringing it to life. They've done a really good job at keeping to time and you've come up with some great questions. So if we could thank everybody in the usual way, and we've got some gifts for them as well. <coughs>